Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. It's been nearly three months now since I started a new role in this expert witness team and I just thought I'd give you a, a quick update on sort of how I'm doing and what do I think of the new job. There are two major disputes which I'm working on at the moment and without saying any names or going into too much detail, I'll kind of give a brief overview on what I've been doing. This first dispute um, I was working on pretty much from the start from about a month. It's taken a bit of a backseat at the moment and it's in a bit of a lull. There's some other stuff which is going on which um, is taking priority so it's kind of um, in a bit of a weird position at the moment and we're waiting on another company to do certain things. But this major dispute is about structural defects in concrete frames and it's across a lot of different structures across the UK. Um, we're talking maybe 50 to over 100 buildings in which this could be affected. So there's going to be a lot of work for us to do. This dispute has had me looking at um, analysis models, not building them, but reviewing them. I've especially been looking at stuff like slab flexure and punching shear analysis in like really, really great detail, like more detail than I've kind of ever looked into when I was in design. And that's also looking into sort of the old British standard codes and also the Euro codes, because at the time this was designed and built, you could have um, designed a concrete structure to either British standards or Euro codes because it was in that kind of transition period to um, Euro codes from British standards. This next dispute is something which I've been working on for the last sort of month or so, like pretty much non-stop. And this is a major, major dispute in the Middle East. And I think the claim is somewhere around 100 million. So, you know, it's a pretty large sum of money for a claim. Essentially, our client is the contractor and They've done loads and loads of work, um, more work than what was agreed for in the original contract. So there's an argument about how much money they should be owed due to the additional works. And we as a team of experts need to figure out if what was claimed for is correct and if it was justified or not. Because the contractor is a steelworks contractor, we are looking at the sort of the steel design, the fabrication and the sort of the construction of this massive steel frame. What's been really interesting about working on this claim is that even though I don't know if the designers have been claimed against because they, they were the ones who have kind of led to this sort of additional work but I'm not sure if it's because the client has changed certain things which has led to design changes but it kind of got me thinking back to when I was a design engineer and when you submit stuff for, for tender you really don't want any of that information to change because once the contractor has priced it and they've started working it on site if you make any changes, they're going to go absolutely apeshit um, and just try and claim money for it because that's not what they price for. Contractors don't like change, you know, if it's, especially if it's changes which cost them extra money, you know, if it's change which makes things more efficient, yeah, they're all for it, but they don't reimburse you any money for it. But if you make a change and it, you know, costs them extra because, I don't know, you've cost them extra 10 tons of steel or something, they're going to try and claim money back for that. They're going to try and squeeze you for any every penny for it. So this kind of just got me thinking back to, you know, when I was a design engineer and how it was just so important that at the tender stage, you just got things absolutely spot on. It's definitely really, really interesting. And it's basically like a giant puzzle and you're trying to use all your technical knowledge, which you've gained all, after all these years to try and solve this puzzle or problem. There's a lot of research which goes on in the background, you know, it's not all about just writing a technical report. To write a technical report, you have to do a lot of research. For this huge job in the Middle East, I had to read through a ton of documents, sometimes doing like a full days of re reading and not really coming up with anything. But it's also really important that, you know, you find these little snippets of really important bits of information and you kind of follow these leads. And just sometimes these leads just lead to nothing. But sometimes these leads can lead to like some seriously really important information which could kind of help you crack this massive puzzle. It's still really early days, but I've been learning absolutely loads and there's still so much for me to learn, which is why I'm kind of really enjoying it because of just the sheer amount of stuff which is different, but also related to my previous job. There's just so much to learn um, which is just really exciting for me. So I only met my manager on the very first day where I kind of picked up all my gear, all my like, laptop, my phone and everything and got a very, very brief and quick introduction to the office. After that first day, I was um, working from home, so never got to meet anyone. I've only met the other team members who are in different offices um, through um, Teams or video calls. 
It's definitely a very weird way to start a new job, but I think the team and the company have done a really good job at making sure that kind of introduction period was done well. And I think they've done a really good job. Our team, uh, as in our expert witness and advisory team, is split across different offices. So I'm in the Bristol office, but I think the majority of the team is headed up in uh, Manchester, but then we've also got people who work in our London office as well. I think the plan is when lockdown is over and restrictions are kind of eased, um, we'll be meeting in an office or somewhere more central just so that all the new starters can sort of meet face to face. The team itself has actually expanded like I'm a new starter and just a few months before me there was a couple of new starters. Since I've joined there's been a new starter or two as well so I think it's looking really good as a team that we're recruiting and hiring new people. As a team we've already secured our next year's workload so that's a really really good sign and it's just a really really nice position to be in especially with the pandemic going on and other industries possibly not doing so well it's really reassuring to know that we've already got you know a year's work ahead of us remote working has been absolutely fine for me i do quite like it um, but i also do miss kind of the office environment as well and i've spoken to my manager about it and we're both in no rush to really go back to the office. Um, I think the plan is, or our plan is anyway, that once um, the government has told us that we'll be able to go back into the office, we'll probably start off doing sort of two, two or three days in the office and the rest we can work from home. It's gonna be pretty flexible, which is kind of why I do like this company. Um, and it's just a good way of working, in my opinion. And not being in the office hasn't really slowed down our work rate or, you know, slowed down our sort of efficiency at all. I just think it's good that we're embracing the technology available to us. Even though me and my manager are working on the same project, we are working on different parts of the project. And I do need help on certain things, but I have, you know, no problems and he has no problems with me just ringing him up on you know, Teams just for a chat, just to explain a problem and just help me out. So I think in that respect, it's been really, really good. I think overall I am really enjoying this new role, there's plenty to learn and everything is just really really interesting and quite exciting. There's obviously things I dislike, like I kind of mentioned there's like a lot of research and some of the research can be a bit dull and a bit boring and some of the admin work as well, you know, going through like 10,000 documents is not exactly um, that interesting. But I understand it's really really vital that you are able to sift through say 10,000 documents which is actually kind of what I did for this um, Middle East project, there were 10,000 documents. I obviously didn't read 10,000 documents, but it's important to sort of skim through the really important bits and kind of cherry pick the right information to look for. As you look through information, you'll, you'll see documents being referenced, so that's kind of a lead which you'll go into, and that can be quite interesting actually. But I mean, like in any job, there are definitely things which is not going to be to your taste. You know, as a design engineer, there are definitely things which I disliked and things which I did like. And that's kind of the same with this new job. Expert witness work is not something you can do fresh from university. You need to have a lot of years in design work to be able to tackle these problems. Essentially what expert witness work is, is you've got a completed structure, so you have to work backwards um, and try and figure out what the designer or what a contractor has done to lead to this outcome. Without the years of experience in design, you're not going to be able to come up with a very good answer or solution. Another reason why you can't just jump out of university and go straight into expert work is because you need to be chartered or professionally qualified. Because you'll be working with lawyers a lot, um, your credibility matters so much. Imagine yourself in the situation where you're going to be cross-examined by a really experienced barrister or a lawyer. Even if you write a really, really good report with all the right facts and everything is you know, spot on, but you're not qualified or you're not chartered, that barrister is going to attack your credibility in every way that he can. And he's probably going to win if you're not chartered because, you know, I don't know how they'll do it, but they're going to, you know, really, really discredit you personally. And it's got nothing to do with the report, which is why it's so important that to be, uh, you know, an expert witness or to work in this field, you do have to be qualified or chartered. It's definitely a strange time to sort of move companies and start a brand new role, especially amongst, you know, a pandemic and all of that. But I think I'm really glad that I did make the switch. Anyways, without dreading much on, hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Please remember to like and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video. Cheers.